Hello! If you recognise this image, there's a good chance you're about to feel ancient, because this device is nearly 30 years old. Blimey, crikey, and other British colloquialisms nobody really uses anymore. Yes, it is Sony's PlayStation, the beginning of one of the world's major consumer brands, I suppose. And the device that brought CD-ROM gaming to the mainstream. And I don't know why they bothered making it, frankly. They only sold over 100 million units worldwide. <laughs> oh, that's a lot of consoles. 100 million units. Well, more than that, that's... Yeah, that's quite a lot of little grey boxes of joy, isn't it, to say the least. But before we get into it, I'm going to tell you that this video is sponsored by SEX! as in CEX, Complete Entertainment Exchange, which is a chain of retail shops here in the UK with other branches around the world, including Australia, which buy and sell electronics and gaming goods and that. And yes, the official pronunciation is sex. That's not me being weird. Big thanks to them for sponsoring this video and lending me a load of stuff I'm about to show you in it. So, cast your minds back to 1994. Unless you weren't born then, because that'd like involve you, I don't know, imagining infinity backwards or something, and that'd like really do your neck in. Anyway, the point is, in late 1994, the PlayStation was released by Sony in Japan. And my goodness, there was quite a lot of talk about it amongst us video game types, to say the least. It wasn't released here until nine months later. So there was a lot of talk of, wow, it does 3D and Ridge Race is amazing and all this kind of stuff. I know of somebody who drove to the airport to meet someone getting off the plane from Japan with a PlayStation and a copy of Ridge Racer like two days after it was released or something. They probably had one of the first PlayStations in the country. And if I remember, they had great difficulty getting it to work with a television, but that's another story entirely. So this was Sony's first foray into the world of video games. Um, started life as a CD-ROM add-on for the Super Nintendo, and, well, uh, everyone kind of fell out over it, and then Nintendo ended up going with Panasonic or something, if I remember correctly. So Sony went, blithering crikey, let us go and make our own CD-ROM device for playing the games. And they did, and this is it. It's as simple as that, except for loads of really complicated bits in the middle that I've missed. Yeah, as I said earlier, first mainstream CD console, really. I mean, not actually the first CD console. That would have been the PC Engine CD-ROM thing, the TurboGrafx CD, I think it was called in America. Was it the CD-ROM 2 or the CD-ROM Squared? I know it's got a 2 on it. It was released in 1988, anyway, which is obviously several years before the PlayStation, but uh, lacked the power as a direct result. Then there was the Philips CDI and the Sega Mega CD, the FM Towns Marty, another Japanese-only one, uh, Amiga CD32, 3DO, Bandai Playdia, and the Sega Saturn did come out a little bit before the PlayStation. So it certainly wasn't first on the block with the CDs, but, well... It was by far the most popular, and my goodness, popularity and PlayStation, yeah, very much hand in hand, shall we say. Very successful marketing. Basically, when this came out, about a few months later, it was the coolest thing in the history of all known universes. It was bought more by adults at the start. Um, though I think the price had a lot to do with that. I believe when the price went down, um, kids sort of got into it more. But basically, this was marketed in a quite an adult and clever way. And all the cool people and all the cool Manchester bands had them and all this kind of stuff. And you could literally go into nightclubs in the UK and play Wipeout on one of these, you know, Psygnosis' is cool futuristic racing game. And basically, that made it super bloody cool. Mm. Because I always back the winner, I bought a Sega Saturn first. It was one of those situations where I looked at the games available for both machines, PlayStation having just come out, and was like, there was no competition. All the games I wanted were on the Sega Saturn. 14 seconds after I bought it, <laughs> that very much changed. And I then went and bought a PlayStation as well later, because fortunately I had a job at the time. I have distinct memories, actually, of managing to find the last one of these in Norwich. It was a Dixon's, if I remember. Sadly, this is not that original unit that broke years ago. I can't actually remember where I bought this one from. Um, from somebody who's left it out, I think, in the sun a little bit, because it's got slight discoloration on it, which is annoying, but we'll live with it. Sproing. Yes, that's where the CDs go. Ah, memories. Memories of this noise.
God, I love console startup sequences. Right then, let's have a look at the device. Compact disc, Sony, PlayStation. That's all you need to know, other than the fact that that's the reset button, that's the power button, and that's the open button. That's why they wrote what they were on them. Yep, turn it on, reset your game. Press that and that opens, press it again and it closes. I know I've shown you that already, I just really enjoy the satisfying click noises. Mmm, nice action. Right, one and two, but what are these? Well, there's lots of the memory card. You can tell by the way they've written memory card on them. We'll come on to memory cards in a moment. And of course, controller ports so you can actually control your games. Not a whole lot on the sides of this. Not a whole lot on the bottom, really, other than some little feet so it doesn't scratch up your hi-fi unit. But on the back, this is where it gets interesting. Oh yes, look, power in, wow! Yep, standard figure of eight, connect it directly to the mains type thing. AV multi-out, so that's generally how you'll connect it to your television at the time. Although you can also do it via the video out there, which is a composite output. Audio out is interesting because some audio files um, used the early PlayStations, which had a really good digital to analog converter in them. To play audio CDs because apparently it gave a very clean sound or something along those lines. I don't know, I'm not an audiophile man. I'm just a man who's here to tell you that the RFU DC out provides power to RF modulators for plugging into really old TVs. And the serial I.O. That's all important because that's how you connect this to another PlayStation via a link cable. And then you can play two player games on two separate televisions and stuff. Good luck getting two massive CRTs of the time together and give yourself a hernia shifting them around in order to do it. But hey, it's worth it for proper two-player fun. And the parallel I.O., which is infamously really difficult to actually get open. You need, like, massive clawed fingernails. Oh, I've done it! Ho ho! I think I get a special uh, letter recommendation for the king for that. Yes, parallel port. This was used for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's something Sony added. I don't think they ever released anything to consumers that actually used this. Third parties did use it though. There was, I think there was a video CD adapter? Did that exist? For the, oh, that rings a bell now. But I tell you what, there definitely were. A lot of cheat devices and even some devices that were used to circumvent all the copyright measures and used for piracy reasons. So therefore Sony, not so keen on the parallel port going forward and actually removed it from later models. But there you go. Ah. What a joy. And you know what? They completely kept this design and never redesigned it until the year 2000 when they released the little PS1. A little diddy version. It's only got your multi out on the back and your power in has an external power brick for this one. Well, not quite a brick. It's not quite that big. And that's slightly less satisfying. It's, it's less of a meaty click, but it is a much smaller thing. Nice little devices, those, and were very uh, cheap at the time, and became very, very cheap a few years afterwards. I own four of these, because I kept picking them up when I saw them for like £15 or less. So there we are. If you need one of these, um, you can't have mine. I need multiple spares. I mean, imagine the absolute worst case scenario of not being able to play Tekken 3 whenever you felt like it. I couldn't live like that. Anyway, another little thing that came with the PS1, as I've shown off in videos before, Whoop. the rather nice screen that it came with, and you could then uh, play portably on this tiny little thing there. But as I say, I've shown those before in various um, third-party versions as well. So let's push those to the back and have a quick think about controllers. Yes, specifically the PlayStation controller, strangely enough. Here it is, and you plug it in via... Oh my god, this leads a lot longer than I remember. Good thing. The mighty three-stage connector there. Clunk, click, and you're in. And yeah, it looks familiar, doesn't it? Because uh, really, the PlayStation um, design of controllers hasn't changed a whole lot over the years, other than the addition of two analog sticks for the Dual Shock. Uh, which uh, became very much the de facto controller after it was released in 1997. But yeah, you know how this works. D-pad, you got your left button, your right button, your left bump, your right bumper, and of course the now genuinely iconic square triangle X and O. Yep, or circle and cross, I suppose we should call them really, um, which have become very much a uh, very heavy part of the PlayStation's branding on and off over the years. And your nice analog sticks so you can click, 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 and, uh, you know, use for racing games. And pretty much everything else became very useful for first-person shooters as time went on as well. But as I say, design of the PS5 controller still very loosely with everything in the same sort of um, place. This was uh, really where they 
properly managed to get game controllers properly right for the first time, I think. Um, I mean, not that there's anything wrong with this. Um, although I never liked playing fighting games on the little D-pad there. Mind you, if you want fighting games, you want an arcade stick anyway, I don't know. Maybe I should stop bloody complaining and just get on with the video. Ugh. Yes, controllers always great. Except for the terrible third-party one that you would give your friend because these were so bloody expensive, you would probably only have the one that came with it. Speaking of expensive things that you'd only have one official one of, let's look at memory cards! Yay! This is a memory card. Oh, is this a Japanese one? How odd! Where that came from? Japan, probably. There we are. Slots in there, and that's what you use to save your games on. The problem is, couldn't fit that many saved games on them, and they were quite pricey. Um, I mean, they did come in different colours. Actually, the colour of that, I would presume that's a PS1 one. Nope, I plugged it in. It's like a different colour. Here's a nice translucent red one for reasons. Yeah, I mean, the problem is they're solid state things. They were pricey at the time, and they just don't store that much information. And without them, you cannot save your game. I mean, you can quite happily delete old saved games and stuff from them, but your problem there is, do you really want to wipe out your 35 hours in Final Fantasy VII game just so you can play the new one you've rented? Uh, it's difficult, and that's why we generally had quite a lot of third-party memory cards. Here's one from Gamester. It looks about the same as the others. Here's another one from Gamester. It's got a chunky logo on it. God, I've had this bloody years. This one's quite dusty. Look at it. It's only two megabyte. Oh no, two megabyte was the large one. There were one megabyte ones as well, weren't they? And it went to eight megabyte for the PS2, I believe. Oh, bloody hell, I've been saying megabyte. I meant megabit. 128 kilobytes. It's very hard to get your head around all the old systems of data. They're so much smaller than you remember them being. Oh, look, here's a Joytech one with a big lump on it. Makes it a bit more easy to pull in and out, I suppose. Yeah. yeah it's just got to make sure they're flat at the bottom. Because if not, it won't fit in, will it? Here's one I've had for bloody donkey's years. <laughs> what a beautiful design this isn't. A very cheaply branded one from HMV, a retail chain here in the UK. Uh, yeah, it worked fine though, and that's the main thing, because some of these cheap ones, they'd lose your saved games, and that was bloody terrible. But the cheapest one, or the cheapest looking one I found, is this Chrome Dixon's one. Chrome looks brand new for about three seconds after you take it out of the packet, then it all, the, the vac metalized stuff gets all damaged off it, and yeah, ends up looking like this. These were supplied, by the way, in CD cases, somebody told me, so that's a completely useless piece of information. Jump cut to this absolute unit. Yes, if you wanted to use more than two controllers on your PlayStation and playing, you know, Bomberman or something along those lines, oh my goodness, here is the official multi-tap, which gives you more memory card slots and, I don't know, why I'd really need more memory card slots, but there you go. And also, of course, more controller ports. My god, it's a huge, heavy thing. You could concuss a wildebeest with this thing. Um, there were also cheaper third-party ones that I believe worked just fine. Well, I've never seen one of those. I've only seen this thing that looks like a bracket for holding up an entire block of flats. Anyway, let's look at some of the weirder things you could plug into this device. Clear the sofa, because it's time for less standard controllers, beginning with the official Sony PlayStation mouse. That was a thing, and it's a very standard mouse, really. You've got uh, two buttons, they go click, it feels fine in the hand, seems to be very nicely made, and yeah, it's one of those old school mice with, wait for it, if I can get it out, Arr, escape, yes, a rubber ball, or it's a metal ball coated in rubber, isn't it? And rollers on the bottom. Absolutely marvellous. Who remembers those then? The answer is quite a lot of you, I imagine. But yeah, yeah, you could play some PlayStation games with it, strangely enough. I played Red Alert on it, and it works really well. Yeah, really well. The only thing I tried it with, which wasn't so good, was inexplicably the game Ghoul Panic, which is basically a rip-off of Point Blank, the light gun shooty game. Um, it's You can play it with the mouse for some reason. Um, if you haven't got a light gun or whatever, but there's massive delay on it of like over a second, making it completely useless. So that seems really odd that that is a thing. But generally, yeah, if you had a game you could play on mouse, you could plug in the mouse and play it on the mouse. And, you know, if you are playing some sort of RTS or very clicky clicky game, yeah, it's a much better option, isn't it? I like it, but I tell you what I like a lot more, friends. Light guns! We just mentioned Ghoul Panic and Point Blank, and yeah, this is what you wanted to be playing it on. 
the 1996 Namco Limited Made in Japan MPC-103 <gasps> GunCon from Namco. Look at that. Comfortable pretty much no matter what size your hands are, unless you've got the tiny hands of an elf, then it might be a bit of a problem. But yeah, the way this worked was you'd point it at your television and click it and it'd shoot things on the screen. That's not the technical explanation, but really, that's what was happening from a gameplay perspective. The sad news, as well, pretty much all of you will know, is that, tragically, light guns don't work on modern LCD televisions. You need one of the old CRT ones. You know, the ones that gave you a hernia if you tried to carry them from one room to another. So that's a bit of a shame that this is sort of deprecated. Now, there are other methods. There's something called the Sindon light gun, which works very well, but I'm not sure of the PS1 compatibility for that, or if there is even is an adapter for it. But basically, these cool devices you ain't going to be using unless you have an old-school CRT television. Oh. I'll tell you what else deserves an aww. Oh. The fact that back in the day lots of us couldn't afford the standard gun con. I knew I couldn't, so this is the actual one I had back in the day. I bought it from HMV. Can you tell? <laughs> this is a very uh, simple, uh, cheap and quick light gun. A Scorpion, which was rebadged by many people, including HMV. Look. Um, this, i got to say, isn't bad, though. It's pretty comfortable. You can manual reload by hitting the back, and you can go clicky-clicky a lot, and it's got auto-fires and stuff. It's even got the proper gun con mode, on or off, for the extra stuff. Yeah. This is actually pretty good. Um, for what it was, it worked absolutely fine. I would have preferred a gun con, because it's a little bit more comfortable and a lot cooler, but hey, this did the job back in the day for us paupers. Right, <clears throat> there's something else I should show you quickly. If you do have a CRT television and you want to get into playing light gun games on the PS1, that's what you want. <laughs> to be honest, you can't really go wrong with any of the light gun games. They're all a laugh in one way or another, but these are the good ones. And if you can't get Ghoul Panic, don't worry too much about that, because frankly, it's just a rip-off of Point Blank, just with more cats. But yeah, they're all the super important ones. Right, what convention would you go to if you wanted to hang out with a load of really negative people? Probably NegCon! Or maybe it's the name of this. Yes, it's definitely the name of this. So this is an intriguing design from Namco who were very keen on their racy, racy games, like Ridge Racer, etc, etc. And they wanted a more interesting way you could play it at home without having to get a massive steering wheel. And so the NegCon was born. You've got analog buttons. These ones here. The more you push them in, the more uh, it goes through in the game, so to speak. Push them down for more acceleration, more brake whatsoever. You've got your control pad start button, a normal A and B clicky clicky button. But of course, as you can see in the middle, You've got that. So you can steer on the screen by twisting it like that. Now that looks kind of stupid, doesn't it? But I've got to say, it works really well. Like, really well. It didn't take me much time to get used to it at all. Like, like a minute or two and that was the lot. And then it was just sort of A, more fun to play, and B, gave you quite a lot of analogue control of... Uh, well, I was playing Wipeout uh, 2097 on it, but um, other games are available. Uh, yeah. It's kind of really good. I was genuinely really impressed with this. It's got a nice bit of finesse. Uh, you can be very precise with it. And also you can quickly go if you need to suddenly turn a corner. And that's quite fun in and of itself. Very impressed with that. Well done, Namco. Unfortunately, slightly less impressive was their next one. Now, I've had one of these for years. and I never quite got on with it. Um, I liked it a lot more until I used the Nikon. <laughs> Let's just say that. It's the JogCon. Yes. So they came up with this a few years later, and you steer like that, or like that. We can hold it like that if you particularly want, but that doesn't seem really very racy. Um, yeah, you get the idea. Other than that, it's pretty much a standard um, PlayStation controller without the analog sticks. Uh, yeah. Hmm. But what is the super mode? Why does this exist when they already had the other one? The answer is force feedback. When you are playing with this on a proper game that supports it, wait for it, it fights you. It actually moves the, a little motor and it moves the thing away from you. So you're trying to steer and it's like the other way, which is quite good fun. But unfortunately, being fought by the controller gets on your tits after a fairly short period of time, or it did for me anyway. And I don't know, it just lacks, it lacks the finesse and the fun of twisting the other controller. The little thing here isn't, I mean, if you've got a chance to give it a go, give it a go. It is interesting, but it's not for me as good as the other. But the big problem is there are a lot of games obviously released before this came out. 
so it doesn't support the force feedback. There is a NegCon emulation mode, which you can uh, force it into and it starts up, and you can play all the games from the NegCon using this, but the dial won't auto-center. So it's all kind of a bit pointless then, isn't it? You may as well be playing it on the NegCon, really. But it's an interesting thing, and I can't help feeling if this came before the NegCon, <laughs> it might have sold a bit better. But there we go. The important thing is, we've got this dinner plate. I mean, the air pad. Mmm. <sighs> this feels super cheap. The top of it comes off, so you can customise it like an early mobile phone. Mm, where are we? There we are. Put different colour ones on or whatever. Um, yeah, so fascias apart, the AirPad Corporation, airpad.com, I'll bet that's not relevant anymore, produced this, I don't know, Star Trek looking thing from this side. Well, I, do, 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 do. Oh no. Um, yeah, it's uncomfortable to hold uh, because you can't get your fingers around the bloody bumper buttons there quite properly. But of course, the idea is wait for it. You can play like that by tilting left and right and forward and backward. Isn't that tremendous? The answer is no. Uh, I'll be honest, it's better than I thought it would be, but I thought it would be a completely useless pile of shit. And in fact, it's only mostly useless. <laughs> um, it's not too bad for sort of general going around corners and stuff in racing games. But then, if you have to do anything with any actual accuracy, this totally lacks the finesse to do that. Um, it just doesn't have precise controls and ends up kind of useless for actually playing games. As a result, you would have to play on the uh, D-pad there, which is not great. The only thing I really like about this is the bizarre symbols they've come up with to inexplicably replace the standard PlayStation symbols. Hmm, there's something in it. You've got Chocky, uh, Graph Paper, uh, Stay on Target X-Wing Commander, and Hypnotic Spiral of Doom. The Uzumaki you can't escape. So yeah, that's not the greatest thing in the world, but I'll tell you what is the greatest thing in the world. I was so pleased when I saw this for sale. It's a controller made by ASCII. It's got a little Pingu on it. And Pingu's sibling. <laughs> noot noot. Yep, these aren't little models somebody has attached. Uh, this is actually a dual shock compatible controller. It's a bit knackered though, I need to fix that cable as you can probably see. Um, yeah, made by uh, ASCII there. ASCII pad, Pingu version. Oh, it's got rumble in it and everything. Look, you can see the little spinny things. Oh, isn't that so cute? I find it completely unusable because uh, it's strangely enough, it's designed for people with small hands having children's TV characters on it. <laughs> Gee, I wonder how that happened. But it's an interesting thing. But the most important thing is if you're ever doing badly in your game, you can look down and see Pingu and feel much worse because he's silently judging you for your crap gameplay skills. Curse you, Pingu! <laughs> But of course, no look at PS1 controllers would be complete without the glove. Not the power glove, that was Nintendo. This is just the glove. So the idea is control your games with one hand um, by strapping this to yourself. And then you've got all the buttons under your fingers here. Blib, blah, blib. You've got your D-pad under your thumb. And then forwards and backwards, up and down, is done by tilting your wrist. And there's also a little digital analogue selector thingy switch on the bottom. So let's jump cut to me having strapped this on, and yeah, you get the idea. Um, the, the problem is, I can't tell if this is a serious attempt at assistive technology for people missing a left hand, or... Is it just a gimmicky poo? I really don't know, and it doesn't work too well, so I can kind of leaning towards the latter. I mean, yeah, here's how you go up and down your game. Here's how you go left and right. It's not really a very sensible system for anything that isn't a sort of racing game, and even then, it ain't great. I mean, I call this a D-pad earlier. It's not. I mean, it's technically kind of a D-pad, but really, it's just your, um, you know, L1, L2. R1, R2 buttons, your bumpers and your bits at the top. So that's not, yeah, not amazing. Um, also, you need to have very small hands to be able to use this. This drives me mad. I kept trying to hit the start, select and reset. Like I just can't bend the fingers down far enough. Um, so I know it was made for younger people or something. So the idea is you actually hold it out like this, as if you are shaking hands. Hello, I've got the glove. Um, yeah, and up, down, up, down, left, right, left, right. As I say, imagine trying to uh, play a sort of platform game like that. 
It's not going to work too well. But for racing games, the left and right is it's still not great, to be perfectly honest with you. Not really very good at all. Um, it's, it's pretty bad, <laughs> that's all I can say. Maybe somebody out there used it quite a lot and got used to it, but um, yeah, I just couldn't get any, again, couldn't get any finesse going on with it. And also, going like that a lot really hurts your wrist. Let's avoid the obvious jokes. But anyway, yeah, it's, this is not a great thing. It is kind of a bit of a mess. It looks like a mess, and it kind of is a mess, and it's a bloody shame. I mean, maybe it was, maybe it was a good option if you only had a right hand, I don't know. But it's pretty useless if you only had a left hand, <laughs> so, um, yeah. I think we shall consign this to the dustbin of history. Away with ye! Now, before we get into the actual games, there's one more thing to show. This little baby thing. Look! It's a tiny little console called the Sony Pocket Station! And anybody who's had a Dreamcast is going, that looks familiar. Well, it's even more familiar because... It's technically a memory card. Yeah, plug it into the front of your PlayStation, and then you can put little games on it. Bear in mind this was released just after the Tamagotchi craze. Um, yeah, and then you can play things on the move. And as we say, the Dreamcast had the VMU memory unit, which came out about six months before this. I always thought this was kind of a rip-off of it, but I imagine with that shorter time scale, could they have developed something that quick off the back of it? Probably not. I imagine they were probably in development at the same time. But the important thing is, it's not as good as the Dreamcast VMU for one simple reason. The Dreamcast VMU sits in the controller and you can see the screen, so you can use it while you're playing games. This sits in the front of the console and it is a memory card, so you can't see the screen at all. Oh, it's a bit of a shame, isn't it? But other than that, it did quite well. I mean, it sold a lot of units in Japan, like a lot, like one and a half million or something, I think. An awful lot of these went out and it was never released outside Japan. Don't know why that is, maybe it was just seen as old hats by the time they got round to that. Maybe they couldn't fulfil demand in Japan, so, you know, they never had the stock to put elsewhere. I don't really know. Um, incidentally, the little infrared thing on the top there for transferring um, data between two of them. Infrared is like the worst way of transferring data there is. It's, oh, it can literally be interrupted by dust particles and is farcically slow. But hey, it's something, isn't it? And plus they weren't exactly massive files, so uh, that's not much of a thing. So looking at it physically, you've got an up button, a down button, a left button, a right button, and a select button. You've probably spotted that. What you may not know, though, is it runs off a 2032 battery and it actually came with this PlayStation branded one. I don't know if you can see that. Yes, there we are. That's interesting, isn't it? Not particularly. Let's get back to this. <clears throat> so, uh, basically, the main thing for this were Tamagotchi-like games. It was sold as like a bundle pack, I think, with a, with a Tamagotchi-like game. Um, there were also Tamagotchi-like stuff for Final Fantasy VIII. Had a thing you could do, you'd like bread a chocobo or something. And Street Fighter Alpha 3, sorry, Street Fighter Zero 3, because it was the Japanese one, um, had some sort of mode where you could put your fighter on it and like, I don't know, power them up in the game when you weren't playing the game or whatever. So the big question on everyone's lips is, have they hacked this these days so it will play Doom? And the answer is yes. <laughs> Tragically, though, I couldn't get it to work on this one. It wouldn't go past the title screen. And so... So, while we're looking at all this PS1 hardware and accessories and games and things, did you know you can buy most of them from sex? Yeah, I know, I can't get used to that pronunciation either. Look, we'll work through it together. It'll be fine. So, not only can you buy retro gubbins and electronic bits and pieces from Sex, but they will also buy them off you for cash or store credit. And if you're anything like most people in this country, you probably have an old phone or something that you put in a drawer and then thought, oh, I'm going to sell that. Yeah. And you never got round to it, did you? Well, what you could do is go through all your old drawers, pick out all your electronic stuff that you haven't used for years, and take it to one of Sex's retail stores and swap it for something you do want. Look, example time here, right? Boom. So, that is an old iPad Air from nearly 10 years ago. I've still got and I haven't used in, I dread to think, how long. Uh, that's an old phone we don't have any use for anymore. And that's two pounds two pound coins, specifically. And if I was to take them to sex, do you know what I could get for them? PlayStation 1 with cables and uh, power brick, obviously. DualShock 2 controller. Copy of Wipeout 2097 on platinum. Copy of Final Fantasy 7 non-platinum. And a memory card to save your games onto. 
You see, you can swap things you don't want for things you might actually want, as opposed to just leaving them until they're worth absolutely nothing and they just end up in a landfill. I'm not judging, we've all done it. In fact, I think I had that iPad in a drawer for like at least three years. Why? Why? And if they don't have what you want in store, you can get store credit and then use it on the website and they'll send it to you from one of the stores where it is in stock. So why not clean out your drawers for sex, everyone? Wow, that came out wrong. Quick, cut to the next bit. And now the important bit, the games. For what is a games console without games? The answer, of course, is an Atari Jaguar. Ayo. Right, <laughs> let's get on with it then. This was an interesting time in games because 3D was the new hotness. It was the cool thing and everybody wanted the 3D stuff. And yeah, PlayStation was delivering that in spades. But equally, um, kind of went a bit far. I mean, magazines at the time, Christ, you could have written like the best 2D platformer in the history of the universe and they would have spat on it before flushing it down the toilet. Like, like everything had to be 3D or it was, oh, it's just old fashioned, oh, what's the point of this? And it's interesting looking back now because the sort of 2D games of the era still sort of hold up due to um, the 16-bitty kind of 2D aesthetic still looking quite cool, whereas the 3D aesthetic of the time just looks like a really old game. It's, it's much harder to sort of get your head around old 3D, I think. Doesn't mean there aren't some still good games worth playing on the old 3D on the PlayStation, absolutely, but it's just interesting how everyone was so obsessed with the 3D at the time, and yet it has not aged as well visually at the very least. So. Let's have a look at 10 games which were PlayStation exclusives, which I think are interesting for one reason or another. This isn't a list of the greatest games on PlayStation or anything, so don't get upset if your favourite game isn't on here or I'm not mentioning a certain one or something. It's just 10 exclusives that I find interesting. Starting with... Tenchu! Stealth Assassins, one of my favourites. Live by honour, kill by stealth. Right, we're going to chuck some gameplay on here soon. Should point out that all gameplay in this video is uh, captured from original hardware. There's no emulation or anything, it's all captured from one of the PlayStations I showed you earlier. So, this is a bloody great game, and 18 rated, ooh! So Tenchu, as you have probably guessed, is about ninjas! And they're vicious buggers, you know? They go and kill people who Lord Goda has told them to, because these people were bad, because you're still kind of the good guys, because it's a video game. Yeah, kind of love Tenchu! It's very, very stealthy. Uh, the the controls don't hold up that well. You do have to get your head around them, but once you do, ho -ho, some of the best stealth action going. You basically run around rooftops and avoid guards and other people like that, and well, if you need to dispatch them, run up behind them, jump down on top of them, and kill them immediately. Something I like about this game is it's relatively difficult to actually fight the guards. I mean, they're not like absolutely rock hard or anything, but you do get the impression that your ninja assassin characters aren't that great fighting one-to-one, -one, because of course that's not what they're there for. You know, they are stealth assassins. They're not uh, trained to go and necessarily beat people face to face. And that gives this sort of better air of it where you really do want to keep stealthy on it. Interestingly, this got hit by the uh, BBFC, the British Board of Film Classification at the time, which were obsessed with ninjas, or more to the point, obsessed with ninjas being bad. And they made them change out the shurikens for the UK version with kunai knives, which are effectively exactly the same in the game. It's just the sort of ridiculous things that were going on at the time this game was released. There is a sequel, Tenchu 2, is also pretty great, and there's a lot more games in the series as well. They seem to be sort of diminishing returns after that. And there is a modern game with some of the DNA in it, Sekiro Shadows Die Twice uh, has a sort of bit of tension with it, um, especially sort of the grappling hook stuff. Right, that's enough ninjas, time for a story about some vagrants. Specifically, Vagrant Story from old Squaresoft, the Final Fantasy people. Do you know what, while we're here actually, let's have a quick look at the case. We haven't uh, discussed the PlayStation cases, have we? Basically, it's an easily shatterable, specially designed jewel case uh, that holds the almighty manuals, still quite important with some of the games back then, and the discs, which are effectively... Oh, it's a dusty one, must dust that one off. Um, effectively, yeah, black uh, CDs, really, which made them very difficult to copy and do naughty uh, piracy things with. Um, these, these cases aren't the worst video games are coming by a long chalk, but they do have a tendency to shatter quite easily due to the large amount of plastic. Anyway, 
We're talking about Vagrant Story. Keep yourself alive. As Special Agent Ashley Riot, your mission is to infiltrate the City of Evil. I mean, City of Evil doesn't sound like somewhere you want to go, really, is it? Use your stealth and combat skills to overcome the great dangers. Blah, 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 blah. Basically, this is a 3D action RPG, and it's weirdly kind of unique. It's got really sort of odd writing is the only way I can describe it. It's visually interesting as well, and it sort of creates this world that I don't think I've really experienced in a video game since. Um, the sort of weird Shakespearean almost dialogue and interesting combat system where you can target body parts, and it's just a really interesting and quite unique game. I always felt like I didn't put the time into this game that I should have done back in the day. And you know what? I think I'm going to go back and bloody play it at some point. And you know what? I think I'm going to go back and bloody play it at some point because it does deserve a bit of time put into it. And I'll tell you what else deserves a bit of time put into it. That was a segue. Vib Ribbon. Look at that weird... Oh, hang on. There's an annoying sticker on it. Let's manoeuvre that out. Hey! Look at that weird rabbit made of ghibli lines. Yeah, you've probably heard of Vib Ribbon. If you haven't, I'll explain it now. Well, I'm going to explain it now either way. This is a video. I can't tell. This is Vibri. Take on the Vib Ribbon Challenge. Turn all your favourite CDs into PlayStation games. Yeah. So basically, it's a rhythm game, a very simple rhythm game, where you control the rabbit, have to press different directions or buttons, depending on the obstacles that come along, and all the obstacles go in time with the music of the game. But interestingly... Wait for it. As it says, you can put your own audio CDs into the PlayStation and play along on your favourite tracks, um, which is pretty cool. Gotta say, though, I do kind of love the music that's already in the game. It's very unique. And, of course, there is also a very unique visual style to the game, as you have probably spotted. A sort of ultra-simplified line-drawing thing going on, where it all gets more crazy and jittery the worse you are doing. But Vib Ribbon's a lot of fun. I mean, you could argue some of the early mobile phone games had similar rhythm game mechanics and stuff, but you can't put your own CDs into them. They won't fit. Anyway, time for the greatest game on the PlayStation, Simpsons Wrestling. That was a lie. So, Simpsons Wrestling, right? This is notorious as an absolutely abysmal game. I gotta say, I think that's kind of bollocks. It's not that bad. I think it's approaching it from the wrong angle. The thing is, the Simpsons Wrestling here has lots of big, colourful characters, all the actual actors from the TV show doing the voices, um, crazy, absolutely insane attacks that are in there almost more for the comedy value than the actual uh, gameplay efficacy of them. Flanders in it is massively overpowered, so that's interesting. But the thing about this is, I think people were looking forward to some sort of, you know, proper wrestling game with the Simpsons in, and it's it's not really that at all. It's something more for kids where they can bash buttons a bit and see cool, funny stuff happening on screen. And it's all just a laugh. But it did not go down very well, because as I say, I think people were expecting sort of a proper game, so to speak. Uh, there's a YouTuber called Flandru who did a really good deep dive on this. Um, I think it's called In Defense of the Simpsons Wrestling, and uh, he interviews the development team and stuff. And it's very interesting as to what happened with that. But the Simpsons Wrestling, look, it's only on PlayStation. It's it shouldn't be cell shaded and it is which really does spoil the graphics a bit but overall it's a bit of a laugh don't go into it expecting any amazing gameplay experiences and you'll have a fun time for a few minutes now fun time is not a good description of silent hill <laughs> the classic survival horror game which is bloody great and only for the original playstation a young man searching for his daughter, struggling to exist in a place between reality and hell. Yep, you are in the foggy town of Silent Hill and shit is going down. Really, really bad shit. It is a deeply disturbing time. And also, uh, as you may well have heard, the school in it that you can visit is based on the school from the film Kindergarten Cop, which is such a weird thing, but absolutely true. Anyway, yes, Silent Hill is absolutely one of the best games of this type, I think. Really getting on now, and there's been a lot more games in the series, very few of which have reached the heights of this, although a few of them have, a few of them are better, I would have said. But let's not get into that here. The fact remains, Silent Hill is well worth playing. Not only is it like a historical artefact, but just has a really, really interesting game in its own right. And there's some interesting fighty games on the PlayStation as well. Tobal number one being one of them, with uh, characters designed by the guy who uh, created Dragon Ball Z, I believe. Incidentally, 
new case type. Look, don't see this case type very often. It's got some more um, sort of borders around it. Other than that, very similar to the original. Yes, Tobal number one. It's a fighting game from Squaresoft. And it's super smooth with very um, sort of cartoony, clear, well-defined, but simple graphics. And it just plays really interesting. If you're into your fighting games, well, you, you will probably have played this at some point. It's got a sort of unique feel to it. Um, it's really good fun in two-player, and it's good fun against the computer as well, which uh, doesn't always come across in fighting games. But yeah, Tobal number one is a really good one. I would be recommending the sequel, Tobal 2, but that only came out in uh, Japan. So, uh, tough. It's pity, because it's bloody crazy. It's got like over 200 characters in it or something. There are nowhere near that many in number one. But it is still a very interesting game, and one that not many people talk about, which I think is a bit of a shame. But there we are. Such is life. And I'm now wondering if I should be pronouncing that Tobal or Tobal. Well, it's too late. I've said Tobal now. That is the truth forever. Anyway, that was a good 3D fighting game. Here's an absolutely shite one. Star Wars Masters of Terras Kazi. Masters of Terras Kazi. Kazi means toilet, doesn't it? Masters of Terra's Toilet. Absolutely tremendous. So there we are. There's a plasticky Luke Skywalker with Arden Lynn, the new character, the Terras Kazi Master in this game. Yeah, she's got an arm like a traction engine. Don't think about it too much. I bought this game on the day of release and it's absolute frickin' bobbins. It really is. And because we were so starved of Star Wars stuff at the time, I played it all the way through and unlocked all the hidden characters. One of whom is called Jodo Cast and is literally just Boba Fett, but beige. <laughs> Hell, there's stormtroopers in it and they're just a palette swap of Han Solo. So basically, there's been a big tournament amongst all the Star Wars people and they've got together pre-prequel and had a big fight. And the lightsabers in it are more like the glowing sticks from Futurama that just batter each other with and it doesn't really make any sense, and it's kind of all a mess. There's really horrible controls that sort of don't feel like you do anything half the time. Quite why Darth Vader is in a three-bout knockout tournament, we don't know. <laughs> oh, and also the game's really broken. Uh, Han Solo, or indeed the Stormtroopers, have a special move which is basically unblockable and takes away so much of your health, it's absolutely unbelievable. But hey, it's a relic of a bygone era, and more importantly, it has one of the most ridiculous names in video game history. Or... Exciting fact, they have now made the martial art of Teras Kazi canon. Yep, uh, there's a character in the Solo movie who mentions it. So there we are. We can only hope Arden Lynn turns up in her own Disney Plus series. Right, now we're on to one of my favorites, Bishy Bashy Special. This is a little bit of a cheat because it was an arcade game um, and there is like a Windows version of it, but this is the only one with these specific Bishy Bashy games on. This is, a, I believe, a, a compilation of Bishy Bashy and Super Bishy Bashy. And Bishy Bashy is a two player only game with very simple rules. If you've played WarioWare, think of that, but entirely um, against another person. And it is super, super fun. I can remember sitting down for gaming evenings with people and we'd play this first and we would just never play anything else. There is still nothing quite like it. And again, it's something people just don't talk about enough. Talk about Bishy Bashy more, people. It's bloody fantastic. I mean, on this little PlayStation disc here, you've got 85 different little mini games. That's a lot of different things to beat your mates at or lose against your mates at and then blame the controller, because that's how things work in video games. Uh, I believe this one goes for quite a lot of money now, which is a bit of a shame, because I feel like every home should have a copy of Bishy Bashy Special. Whereas I don't think any homes really should have a copy of Lone Soldier. To be brutally honest, I only put this on the list because the cover art really makes me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> this is just awful, just doesn't play well at all. It's a fiddly mess, and well, there is one positive thing. There's no art this bad in the game itself. Oh my god, I was wrong! First, there was Dino Crisis, and then there was Dino Crisis 2, because that's how sequel names work. Yes! So as you can probably guess, this is a game about dinosaurs. More to the point, naughty ones that you need to shoot. So the first Dino Crisis, I don't enjoy much, to be honest. It's kind of a Resident Evil-y game, to say the least. Um, 
the thing with it is though there's like dinosaurs at the start and there's a load at the end and there's not that many in the middle it just didn't do much for me at all dino crisis 2 on the other hand is more of an action game and it's just sort of big dumb b movie fun shoot the dinosaurs run about i had a lot of fun with this back in the day an awful lot of fun I am cheating slightly with this one. This isn't technically a PlayStation exclusive because there was a Windows version released a few years afterwards, but good luck getting that one to run on a modern computer. Um, so we'll get through on that technicality, I think. The back of the box says bigger, better, more. A perfect balance of action and mystery. And I kind of agree with that. It does feel bigger and more open than the first game. And I certainly thought it was better. I had a ton more fun with it than the first one. So. This is an oddity, right? The last game released in Europe for the PlayStation you would think would be a FIFA game, right? FIFA Football. Well, it was in America, and I think it was in the UK. But in the whole of Europe, it was not. It was Morhen X. There's the Morhen. It doesn't. It looks more like a chicken to me, but let's not get into that. Yeah, it's a German game where you just shoot Morhens. <laughs> That's it. And uh, it's based on some sort of freeware game, which was one of the most popular games in Germany in, like, around the year 2000. Like, it was absolutely massive, these Mohan games. And, yeah, there's a couple for PlayStation. This is Mohan X. Um, yeah, there we are. You can... Uh... So, yeah, I mean, it's a light gun game where you just shoot lots of Mohens. That it really is it, and they're all very comedy cartoony, and there's a couple of different little sub-games in it, and it's extremely simple. What we would call a casual game these days, I think. Uh, you can also play it on the mouse, this one, and obviously through the um, controller if you want to have a really bad time, but yeah, um, surprising, because it's a game I had never heard of, and then discovered... Wow. Last game released for the PlayStation in Europe. These Morhan games are still going. I believe you can get this specific one, like, for the Switch now or something, which absolutely surprises me, but there we are. And that, my friends, is enough for games on the PlayStation, except I've just got to put that there. I just can't, in good conscience, make a video about the PS1 without showing Final Fantasy VII, because uh, when this came out, it blew my mind. First JRPG I ever played. And you know what? It's still kind of great. And the re, uh, modern remake's good as well. Anyway, we've mentioned that, so now we can get on to the end of the video. So, I suppose the thing we should talk about at the end is, if you've got yourself a PlayStation these days, how do you play it on a modern television? Well, all the stuff I recorded for this video I did through a decent RGB SCART lead. Um, technically one for the PlayStation 3, but that does work still with the PlayStation 1, which is fairly impressive for backwards compatibility there. Uh, yeah, I mean... If your television doesn't support SCART, um, you're probably going to have difficulty here. Although I was introduced to this the other day by somebody, which is just a simple device for HDMI out from the PlayStation. Gotta say, works really well. Um, it's not cheap though, about uh, £35 that was, but if you want a simple and very effective way of just plugging your PlayStation straight into your modern television. But there is a simpler method still. For the PlayStation has one of those mini consoles that just connects straight into your television and does the whole job. The PlayStation Classic. With 20 preloaded games and two controllers, although not the DualShock, the only, look, I can't recommend this, I just can't, it's just not very good. <laughs> It's, it's a real disappointment. Of these, it's, there are so many of these mini consoles around um, for various different consoles, and this is just one of the weaker ones. It really is. The emulation isn't very good, and it's glitchy. Um, the game selection isn't amazing either. Uh, I mean, there's a couple of good ones on there, but it's, it's missing a lot. Of, it, it's just kind of meh. The whole thing just doesn't work as well as it should, and it hasn't got the games on it should, and it's, it's just a bit depressing. In fact, I bought one of these when it was released, and I spent ages, a couple of days in fact, recording loads of footage from it. And then when it came to making the video, I found it too depressing. It never did. <laughs> I'm really not a fan of this one. But uh, but if you do want something very easy and you just want to play a couple of, you know, if you just want to play Metal Gear Solid and Tekken 3, which I could understand, um, yeah, that's the easiest way of doing it. It's got Final Fantasy VII. Look, it's got Final Fantasy VII, Metal Gear Solid, Tekken 3. If you're not too worried about um, not having the greatest controller, that'll do you, I suppose. But if you want to properly be experiencing the PlayStation and looking into the more interesting games, yeah, that is not going to do it for you. 
And that, my friends, was the PlayStation, or at the very least, a tiny little sliver of it, because there were an incredible amount of games and accessories released for the PlayStation. Anyway, play us out, Captain Sawada. <laughs>